Good morning. It's good to see you this morning. Turn to your neighbor and say, you look nice today. Doesn't that just make you feel better? Just makes your day go so much better. You feel, you look nice today. There's a lot of things we can, you can get involved in at Calvary. Thank you so much again. For those that uh, have filled out cards and gotten, uh, gotten in contact with Jerry and is helping Jerry, uh, I had one of my uh, teenage girls that went to school this week, and she had her help, Please Help Jerry t-shirt on, and all her students were like, who's Jerry? Who's Jerry? So, uh, but thanks for uh, helping us with that campaign and, and your continued involvement. There's so many things going on at Calvary. And uh, I want to quick give a quick thanks because so many people were involved in this. Uh, yesterday, we had a massive yard sale. Oh, my goodness. It was just stuff like everywhere, everywhere. Uh, and uh, so thank you to all the volunteers, all the workers, all the students, uh, countless uh, hours of work and no sleep. And, uh, but we, we pushed through it. We persevered. Man, and we and, uh, raised some money for fine arts. And, and so those are just some of the shots. You can see just the parking lot just exploded on us. So it's, uh, you know, I mean, you're just, uh, you're just blessed this morning. You didn't drive up and your parking space was taken by clothes. So <laughs> thank you guys so much for all your work. And uh, we've, just, we've had a great week here at Calvary. It's been a great week. We pastors uh, launched out and, and doing the mission thing and just making some, man, just incredible things for God. It just seems like at, at Calvary, we just, it seems like every time we do something, we just we take that next step. We just go over, we go above, we go beyond, and we just keep going. You know, last year we did this, so we're going to raise a bar. And it's just, you know, pa I don't know what Pastor's going to do next year. I don't know if he's going to try to swim an ocean or something. I don't know. But just, just crazy stuff. But, uh, I mean, our youth ministry, we had a great week last week. We had a lot of firsts for us. It was just a crazy. We had district councils, Pastor uh, Tom alluded to earlier. And we were, had the opportunity to go, and we uh, left on Tuesday and uh, took a uh, round trip three hours. On, well, really four with traffic, I guess. Uh, went to Raleigh and, and had a five-minute drama presentation to kick off their, uh, their services. And so that was a, a great time. And uh, it, was, it wasn't just us, but it was students from all over the state. They did choir and they did singing and stuff like that. And we made this piece and it all kind of gelled together. And this, it's one like eight-minute you know, introduction to the, uh, to the services at District Council. So it was, a, it was a great day on Tuesday. And then we turned around. We got a, a call from the news station on 2. Who, who saw the news on Channel 2 Friday morning? If you didn't, you can go to the link on the Facebook page, on Calvary Facebook page, Fluid Student Ministry Facebook page, Fine Arts Facebook page. Or, you, know, you, can, you can find them. The only thing, it is a little weird if you watch it because... They forgot to put the music on the link. And so it looks like our kids are, like, miming. <laughs> so it's a, it's a little funny. Uh, but it, it, uh, it, there was music in the live show. So at 6 o'clock Friday morning, we started our long weekend journey and, and uh, went and got an opportunity to be on the, the news and stuff. And just uh, even just that, that short clip, you know, that short clip that we're proclaiming the message of God. I, I think that's pretty cool, but. Um, so, and then we started out, we had the garage sale, and man, just all kind of crazy stuff. So, here we are, Sunday morning. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord today? Amen. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord today? Listen, this is second service. Listen, I expect some more out of you guys today, all right? We're going to get excited this morning, because I'm running on pure adrenaline today, so come on. How many of you have ever heard the saying, the show must go on? Yeah? Yeah. We know that saying. It's a, it's a show business saying. It's a well-known phrase that says regardless of what happens, regardless of what catastrophes take place, we have a plan. The, the, the stage has been set, and the people are waiting for a show. So the show must go on. I mean, it, we had a little bit of that happen to us on uh, Friday night at the yard sale. We're getting ready, man. We're dropping stuff off. It's just, it just keeps growing and growing and growing. And we're pricing stuff, and it's just a madhouse. And all of a sudden, it's like, man, we had to, I'm telling you, we forecast this down to a T. We knew we were going to have a beautiful weekend. We were waiting, anticipating just beautiful skies, just 70 degrees, just perfect. And, of course, you know, we're in North Carolina. So at 5 o'clock, here's some clouds. We're like, where did that come from? And uh, so we start to get rained on, and we're running frantically around trying to cover everything up. And so it's just not all just soaking wet and 
And uh, so, uh, you know, all our moms and volunteers were looking at each other and going, okay, well, we can't really do nothing in the rain. What are we going to do now? And uh, so a lot of these moms and stuff got up extra early on Saturday morning, and we got here before 6 o'clock. Uh, you know, we had people showing up at 4.30 in the parking lot to get their tables ready. It was just crazy. And so we had a little bit of that. But you know what? The garage sale goes on. I mean, people are going to show up. If you announce a garage sale, people are going to be knocking on your door at 5.30. You know what I'm saying? Like, hey, what stuff you got? So we, we just had to push through. We'd per persevere. The show must go on. You know, I, I, there's another saying, too. I, I'm a sports fan. I wouldn't say I'm a sports fanatic. Do we have sports fanatics in the house? Okay. How many sports fans do we have in the house? Okay. You should know this story. You may not because, I mean, I, I really forgot about it. I had to kind of look it up a little bit. But uh, sometimes I can be accused by my wife of being like an ESPN junkie. Anytime ESPN's in the room, she chooses not to join me. So kind of had to cut back on that a little bit, um, help our marriage out. Um, in 1996, uh, I said I'm a sports, sports fan, so, uh, you know, I like all sports. I'm not biased. Uh, but in 1996, the women's gymnastics team was on top. This was during the Olympics. Uh, the star of the team was a young lady named Carrie Strug. Anybody remember that young lady? She was the, the, the main, one of the main gymnasts, and she actually led the women's team that year to a gold medal performance. It was in her last jump that's played over and over and over in sports history when we talk about ESPN. Because prior to her last jump, all three ladies in the Olympics uh, fell on their vault, on their last vault. They were leading the competition up until the vault, and then all three of the American women fell on their vault. So now they're not leading, obviously. And so Carrie Shrugs comes up on her first jump, and she falls on her vault and in her fall she actually hurt her ankle and so here's the the pressure of 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 the gold medal of the i mean because the united states was supposed to run this thing out the door i mean they just everybody had already put them on the podium before they ever had the ceremony and here they are they're in jeopardy of not even making the podium and so she gets everything within her she musters up all her strength and she makes her last vault and she nails it on one leg and scores us 9.71. Yeah, that's amazing. You, if you watch the video, she actually lands on, uh, on one foot and, like, the toes of her second foot. I mean, and she lands it and she hits it. And immediately when she does her little strikes the pose, you know, I won't do that this morning. <laughs> this is going on video, so I won't strike the pose. But immediately she strikes the pose, she collapses to her knees in pain as she tore two ligaments in her ankle because she'd already injured it before. So they had to carry her off the mat, and they did end up winning the gold medal, and so they carried her to the podium to receive that gold medal. So we understand the show must go on. We understood this weekend the garage sale must go on. And so, but in this, we understand that the games must go on too. Now, this, this phrase, the games must go on, this was coined back in 1972. I had no idea of this. I had to look it up. So, uh, again, do, just through my research, I found this story, and it's, it was named the, the Munich Massacre. You may have heard of it. You may not. But it was 1972 in the Olympics in West Germany. Eleven members of Israel's Olympic team and four Arab terrorists were killed in a 23-hour drama that began with an invasion on the Olympic Village. So get this. In the Olympics, 1972, a group of terrorists invade the Olympic Village, take hostage, and kill 11 Israelis. And the drama unfolds, and it actually ends about 15 miles away from the village on, an, on a military airport strip where all these people are gunned down, and there's this bloodbath that takes place in the middle of the Olympics. So all this is taking place within a 23-hour period. And so the Olympic Games came to a standstill and came to a halt. And there was debate. Do we keep going? Do we, what do we do with the Games? Do we stop? I mean, how do, we, you know, how do we move forward with all this going on? And after all this, the Olympic Committee uh, met, and they decided uh, whether or not they should keep the Games going. And Avery Brundage, the chairman of the International Olympic Committee, uh, uh, said this famous phrase, coined, that's the word I was looking for, coined this famous phrase that says the games must go on. 
And 34 hours later, the competition resumed. So we understand when we talk about the show must go on, the games must go on. We understand those concepts. But neither of these stories, however, compare this morning to the greatest display of will and determination in mankind and in history as it was played out for all humanity as Jesus sits in the garden and he says, God, not my will be done, but your will be done. The greatest a display of will and determination, Jesus said, you know what? The show must go on. You know what? The mission goes on. And this morning, I want to talk to you a few minutes this morning about the mission. Because Jesus sat in the garden and he agonized over the mission. He understood the weight that was upon him. He understood what was going to happen. He understood that this mission caused even caused uh, 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 or was the cause for uh, him to give his life for this cause, for this mission. And he endured the cross for every one of us in this room because of the mission. Jesus endured such pain that we cannot imagine because of the mission. Jesus endured a death that none of us have to pay. He paid a debt that none of us have to pay, that we all owed. He didn't owe that debt. He paid it for us. He went to the cross. You know, just four short weeks ago, we celebrated Easter. How many of you were here for Easter? You can just wave at me. I know you're waving in your heart if you're not. So we celebrated Easter. There were 1,200 people here for Easter that Sunday morning. See all these holes we have this morning? They were full on Easter Sunday. Okay. Now, Besides Christmas comes in second, and then Mother's Day, a close third, Easter is the most attended service in America. I mean, everybody comes out, everybody dresses, you know, that's the day you do your pictures, you know, and your mom, you know, puts you in those plaid pants and the little, you know, bow tie, oh, that was back when I was a kid, but takes you out and does all the pictures and things like that. That's Easter. And we celebrate that. We understand the birth, the resurrection of Christ. But just for a side moment this morning, shouldn't we celebrate the resurrection every week? Shouldn't every Sunday be like Easter for us? Shouldn't every Sunday, shouldn't we come in the house of God with excitement? Shouldn't we come in the house of God with our best? I'm not saying you got to dress to a certain extent. I'm just saying you, you, you come in with your best in mind. You come in ready to worship God. You don't just come in and check your name off the list and say, well, I did my duty this week. I'm talking about giving your all to Jesus. Shouldn't that be every Sunday? And if it was every Sunday, if we had that same passion, that same desire, that same energy every Sunday, don't you think these seats would be full? Oh, okay. Let me go back. I think they would. I'm speaking to myself here, okay? I'm not, this is not casting anything. I'm talking to myself at the same time. But just for a moment, indulge me. Jesus is not a bandage that we can put on when we get cut. Too many Christians wear Jesus like a coat where they can take it off and put it on at their convenience. They can walk in the house and they can hang their coat up on the coat rack and say, okay, I've been to church this Sunday. Now I'm going to go live my life according to my plans. Not God's plans, my plans. Too many Christians live their life as Jesus being the last resort, not the first resort. He is the King of Kings. We're talking about Jesus this morning, the Lord of Lords, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is the one who is. He is the one who is to come. This is where we get excited, church. He is the risen King. He's our Savior. And He's coming back for a church that's ready, right? Christians today treat church too much like a social club. They come in. They wipe their shoes off. They greet people. And then they turn around and walk in the same hell that they walked in the week before. That's not how it should be. That's not how we live our Christian lives. Now, I understand that I'm talking to the faithful here this morning. You guys are here. You got your name checked off. That's awesome. But if it is hitting you, just let it soak a little bit. How are we doing during the week? Do we treat God that the mission goes on? Do we, do we fully follow after God with passion? You know, do we go out and fulfill God's plan or are we fulfilling our plan? 
Are we going out and fulfilling the great commission in our life? The mission of Jesus was finished on the cross. You understand that, that the mission of Christ was finished on the cross. It even says it in John chapter 19, verse 30. It says, when he received a drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Jesus' job was done on Calvary. But the disciples' job had just started. And our job as a church continues today. Amen? His job was finished, but ours is just getting started with the mission. Because the mission goes on. Even though Christ is not with us, Christ is not walking on this earth anymore, the mission goes on. How does it go on through us? It goes on through everyone that's sitting in this church today. The mission of God goes on through us. The disciples got this. They understood this. It took them a little while because they were a little hard-headed, okay? But they got it. And we as a church need to get it as well. What is the mission, you ask? What's the mission? Well, it's simple. Really simple, man. I don't really try to like complicated things. I don't like to complicate things. Uh, my wife is the detail person. If you ask me about an event, I'm like, hey, it's going to happen. We're going to make it happen. Because I'm just, I'm not that complicated. I'm a pretty simple guy. So when I look at Scripture, I see it in a, in a simple way. I know it's very complicated. I'm not, I'm not saying it's not. It's very complicated, and there's many ins and outs to it. But at the same time, the mission of God should be simple, right? To know God and what? To make Him known. What's the mission of God? To know Him and to make Him known. What's the mission of the church? To know Him and to make Him known. What's my mission in life? To know Him and to make Him known. How do I know this? Matthew 22, verse 36 says, says this, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Someone asked him, and he said this, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And, the, and this great commandment is the first and the second is like it that you shall love your neighbor so love god love others that's pretty simple and all the other commandments all the other laws of god hinge on these two, very two laws to know god and to make him known that's our mission is it easy no we all know that if you think living a christian life is easy you 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 probably haven't been living christian life too much it's not easy. It's not for the lighthearted. It's not for the, for the weak. It is for someone that has the will, determination to say, you know what, the mission goes on. Even though, you know, I struggle, the mission goes on. Even though I fail, the mission goes on. Even though I have hard times, the mission goes on. Jesus, uh, uh, or John in 16, 33, it said, I have told you these things so that you may have peace. That in this world, you will have trouble. Jesus told us, you will have trouble. But take heart, he said. He followed that up. He said, take heart, because I have overcome the world. You will have trouble, but take heart. Guess what? The mission goes on. The mission goes on, and you will be more than an overcomer, the Bible says. So the first thing, how does the mission go on? The mission goes on through our trials, through our tests, and through our struggles. The mission goes on. Let's go back for a moment to the disciples. Try to put ourselves in their, in their sandals, so to speak. You know, try to walk, try to put yourself and imagine yourself in that period of time. Here's the disciples. And in their mind, and in all the Christians' mind there, that, that uh, if you read the scripture, see, for me, I, uh, since Easter, we talked about Easter, since Easter, I've been, I've been kind of reading the point, like, after Easter, what happened? Okay, Jesus, you know, he appeared to his disciples, he did that, he rose from the dead. Okay, why did he appear? What was the message? I, that's where I've been living, that's where I've been reading. And then, I, so I got in the book of Acts, and so I've been reading through Acts, and uh, seeing this, this kind of the before Christ and the after Christ. And, and, you know, the mission didn't die with Jesus on the cross, it just started. That's what I get when I'm reading those scriptures and I put myself in the disciples' shoes and I think, man, these guys, man, they walked with Jesus. They talked with Jesus. They knew Jesus. They ate dinner with Jesus like every night. They hung out with Jesus. They lived with Jesus. They saw the miracles face to face. They saw 
Jesus feeding the 5,000. They saw the, the miracle multiplication. They saw the dead being raised. They saw the blind see and the deaf hear and the lame walk. They were witness to all these things. And as Jesus enters in the city the last week before he's crucified, what are they doing? They're laying down palm branches. Why? Because they're, they're welcoming in a, in a king's welcome. Because in their mind, Jesus is still going to rule and reign in, a, in an earthly throne. He's going to come in. He's going to fix all the problems. He's going to take care of everything. So here's the disciples, they're walking in the city, and this is a parade, man. This is a, people are shouting, they're singing, the Bible says, Hosanna, Hosanna, and they're just going crazy for Jesus. It's just like this massive pep rally for Jesus. But then things didn't turn out the way they thought they would. So we see them all enter in, in, in the city, and we see this triumphal entry. But then we see when Jesus is, is at his lowest, when Jesus is in the garden, when Jesus is praying, and he goes to the disciples, they still don't get it. They still don't understand. He goes, he said, can't you pray with me for an hour? Can't you wait? Listen, you need to be ready because something's about to happen. And then they take him off. And all these disciples that had followed him, all these disciples that were eyewitnesses, all these disciples that had seen the mighty work of God, seen him walk on water. Man, they seen him command the wind and the rain. I tried to do that yesterday, but it didn't work out. I was praying, though, Lord, move this rain. Keep moving it. Keep moving it. They saw him speak to the weather, and it stopped immediately. Mm. But get this. All those disciples, not one disciple was mentioned at his crucifixion. Wait, no, let me, let me take that back. Peter. Yeah. Where was Peter? Down by the fire, denying him three times. The most passionate disciple that we read about in Scripture is down by the fire acting like a little girl. I don't know, Jesus. No. No. Sorry, I don't mean to offend him. But Jesus, uh, you know, Jesus was there. At the very end, there's nobody there. Can you imagine what's going on in the disciples' head? Is there their Savior, their King? This guy that they, man, they just, they, they, they've just been under his tutelage for so long. It's like, now he's gone. Now what? Now what? The mission goes on. Through the trials, through the tests, the mission goes on. The world, the disciples' world was upside down. I mean, it had been turned upside down. And the early church, you can read through the book of Acts, and you see that the early church faced many trials and many tests and many struggles. Many of them were hunted down and killed for the cause of Christ. So we will face trials, we will face uh, uh, tests, we will go through struggles, but the mission goes on. And God goes with us throughout the mission. God is there with us throughout the mission. I believe that our trials bring opportunity. Amen? I believe that our tests make us stronger. I believe that our struggles bring us closer to God. Because it's through God that we are victorious. It's through him and him alone. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. Turn to your neighbor and say, power. Come on, y'all say it like you mean. I'm telling a second service, I expect more. Come on. Power. His power is made perfect in our weakness. See, it's not us. It's not our talent. It's not our ability. It's not how well we can sing or, you know, how good we can do this or that. Or what. It's according to his power that he strengthens us and he anoints us and he uses us for the call of God. James said this in chapter 1. He says, uh, talking about the testing of your faith, he said, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. James says here, man, count it all joy. Come on, when you get that cable bill in the mail. Hallelujah. Count it all joy. Come on, when you get in a car wreck on your way to work and you're already late and you, all these things are going wrong. Get, just get out your car and start praising God. Come on. Our first instinct, I tell, mine's not that. 
I don't know about you guys. Maybe you're, 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 you're more holy than I. But my first instinct is not, praise the Lord, I got an accident. Hallelujah. Whew. My insurance is going up. Thank you, Jesus. But James says, count it joy. Why do we count it joy when we go through struggles and trials? Because we know that those things make us stronger. We understand that through those trials, through those struggles, that God is making us into his image and he's forming us according to his likeness. And we're becoming more like Christ. Doesn't the Bible say something about uh, the good of all things working out for us, right? Something like that, right? God knows. Listen, God, it was, no, it, was, it was no surprise, you know, that you got sick. That did, that did not catch God off guard. God was not, whoa, hey, what happened here? Where'd that come from? God knows. And when we put our faith in him and we, we rest in him, that's when we're made whole. That's when we're made stronger in our weakness, the Bible says. One of the greatest examples, I, I guess you could even call him the poster child for, for, for struggles and tests and trials. Uh, well, he, well, he could actually share that poster with another guy named Job. But I'm thinking about Paul, the poster child for struggles. In chapter 2 of Corinthians, he goes through this long list of things. And, man, and you know, you read it and you're like, man, that just guy just, he just went through it. But it starts off, he says, I've worked much harder than you. I've been put in jail more often than you. Been beaten up more times than I can count. At death's door, time after time, I've been flogged five times with Jews' 39 lashes. Beaten by Roman rods three times. Pummeled with rocks. I've been shipwrecked three times. Immersed in the open sea for a night and a day. In hard travel year after year, I had to ford rivers, ford off robbers, struggle with friends, struggle with foes. I've been at risk in the city, at risk in the country, endangered by the desert and the sun and the sea and the storm. I've been betrayed by those who I thought were my brothers. I've known drudgery and hard labor, many long and lonely nights without sleep, many missed meals, blasted the cold, naked to the weather. And then he says, that's just the half of it. This is Paul. is speaking to us. The guy that wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, one of the greatest missionaries that's ever, ever known, that pushed the gospel out, that, that all these things happened to Paul. But yet, when we look a few books down, or verses down, however you want to look at it, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, he says what? He says, indeed, I count everything lost for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ as my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Paul understood. He understood that he would have tests. He understood that he would have trials. He understood that he would struggle in this walk. But he also understood that the mission goes on. Paul understood that. And he said, I count everything lost for the surpassing grace of God in my life. Not only through our tests and trials and struggles, but also through our failures, the mission goes on. The mission goes on. Even though we may fail, the mission of God goes on in our life. Even though we struggle, the mission of God goes on in our life. Even though we may walk away, the mission of God is still in our life. You can never run from God. You can never... Uh, you can never hide from God. We see that in Scripture time and time again. No matter how many times we fail, the mission stays the same. John Maxwell wrote a book called Failing Forward. And in that book, he made this statement. Failure is not final. No matter how many times we fail, that does not determine, determine where you end up in life. What determines where you end up in life is how many times you get up when you get knocked down. Your success depends on your determination. Your success depends on your will to say, I'm not giving up. I don't care how many times I don't get that job. I'm not giving up. I don't care, you know, how many no's I get or how many times I may get discouraged or disappointed. I'm not giving up. When Thomas Edison was asked by a young reporter uh, about the light bulb, 
the story goes like this. I kind of researched this a little bit, so and you can find some different answers out there. But this is a story according to one of the young guys that interviewed him back in the day, and he said, uh, "Mr. Edison, if you felt um, if you if." He said, boldly asked Mr. Edison if he felt like a failure. He asked Thomas Edison, he said, do you feel like a failure? If he thought, and if he thought he should give up. Perplexed by the question, Edison replied, young man, I, uh, he said, young man, I would feel like a failure. Or he said, why would I feel like a failure? And why would I ever give up? Why would I feel like a failure and why would I ever give up? Now... Uh, I know definitely over 9,000 ways that the electric light bulb does not work. And then he goes on to say, after 10,000 attempts, Edison invented the light bulb. He said this to the young reporter. He said, success is almost at my grasp. And this is after 9,000 tries. It's not how many times we fail. Basically, he was saying this, listen, I found one more way that it doesn't work. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Let's move on. Many things that we have today are because of people who never gave up. Many things in technology, uh, all those things, many inventions that we have today are because of determined men and women that did not give up when they faced trials and situations and struggles and, and doors got slammed in their face. No, they did not give up. Okay, that's that's the... The world we live in now let's go let's go let's go to the bible look at the the poster child you know for for failure i would say would be peter here's peter one of the one of the most the the guys that was uh the close one of the closest disciples to jesus and in fact when you see the last supper he even was the one that was emphatic and saying god no not me i'm not gonna leave you i'm not gonna fail you i'm not gonna desert you i'm not gonna walk away from you all these other guys oh, they don't love you like i love you i'm not leaving your side and then where do we find Peter next? <laughs> Down by the fire, denying him three times. Peter failed, utterly failed. Can you imagine Peter? Think about what's going through Peter's mind. When he left that scene, when he left and he heard that Jesus was crucified, the last moment, the last memory that he has is the sound of that stinking rooster. That's what he's left with. And the, and, and the memory of knowing that. I denied my Savior. I failed Jesus. The guy that I, that I said I would never leave, the guy that I said that I would fight till the end, I left him because I feared for my own. We see this moment in Peter's life where he just, man, he doesn't know what to do with himself. You know, we don't get a lot out of that. You can't, you can't read in the, be careful how you read in the context and stuff. There's not a lot to that. But the next time we see Peter is what? What did Peter do? Jesus is gone. Jesus died on the cross. What did Peter do? He doesn't know what to do. The life that he lived for three years was gone. All the things he gave up, his life was gone. So what did he do? He went back to his old lifestyle. Mm. He went back to fishing because that's what he knew. So we find Peter, the next time in Scripture, he's out on a fishing boat doing what he knows to do. Listen, when we fail, when you fail in life, don't go back to what you used to do. That's not going to get you any closer to God. The definition of insanity says this, doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over and expecting different results. That's insanity to me. Is Okay, I failed. Okay, well, let me go back to what I was doing before. That's what Peter did. He went back to what he knew. He went back to his comfort zone. And so we see the next portion of Scripture, the next, the next place we saw Scripture, uh, Peter in Scripture, was him fishing. And then all of a sudden, Jesus shows up on the scene. And Jesus says to Peter, basically, I'm, I'm really loosely paraphrasing this, okay? He says, listen, listen, Peter. He said, just because I'm gone doesn't mean the mission has stopped. The mission continues through you. He told Peter, he said, do you love me? Peter's like, yeah, I love you. And then feed my sheep. And he asked him again, do you love me, Peter? Yeah, God, you know I love you. We, we're, we're, we're tight. Then feed my sheep. And he asked him a third time, do you love me? Then feed my sheep. Do the mission I've called you to do. The mission goes on even through our failures. 
the mission goes on. The mission has not changed. The mandate from God has not changed. The mission goes on, but it goes on through us. Then the next time we see Peter after he's been reinstated in ministry is on the day of Pentecost. We see Peter as he steps forward boldly and preaches over and sees 3,000 people come to know Christ. Why? Because he understood that the mission goes on. He understood that even though he failed, even though he failed miserably, that the mission went on. And God used him mightily to, to, to birth the church and to be one of the founding people that we see as the church begins to take form. John, First uh, uh, John chapter 2 says this. It says, My little children... These things that I write unto you, that you sin not. It's God, God doesn't want us to sin. He doesn't want us to fail. He doesn't want us to walk away from Him. He doesn't. But he says this follow-up scripture. He says, if you do, if you sin, there is an advocate in the Father. Jesus has made a way. Jesus has covered our sin. He's covered our mistakes. He's covered our failures. Whenever we just walk and understand that even through our failures, we can be used. Yes, we can. When, we're, when we understand that the mission goes on and we get up, we dust ourselves off, and we say, God, I'm still chasing after you. So through our tests, our struggles, our trials, through our failures, and even through the desert places, the mission goes on. You know, I've been, I've been in ministry now almost 20 years, and there have been some desert places in my life, some stretches where I'm like, okay, God, I'm up here preaching every week to these teenagers, and I don't, you know, I'm struggling. Anybody ever been to a desert place? Mom, uh, anybody? Okay, just make sure. Yet even in those desert places in our life, the mission goes on. We see it played out throughout Scripture, great men in the Bible. In Scripture, you look at Moses, where was he found? On the desert. The mission went on. God called him out of the desert place. God called him out of a place of, uh, uh, of just nothing and, and seclusion. He went to hide, and God called him. And found him right where he was. What about Elijah? And God found him and he was hiding in a cave. And God came to him and said, what are you doing here? I've still got work for you to do. The mission is not over. The mission is not done. The mission goes on. And what about Jonah? We see Jonah running from God and he's found in the middle of the sea. And God's like, what are you doing? Where do you think you're going? Where do you think you're going? Sometimes we think we can hide from God. The mission goes on. The mission is bigger than me and you. The mission of God goes on through our lives, despite who we are, despite what we have. Because God gives us that. He enables us. The call of God, the mission of God, supersedes everything in our life. Everything in our life. You will never be truly happy until you submit to the mission that he's called us to. I mean, we can have moments of happiness, but true joy, true happiness, true satisfaction only comes through fulfilling the mission of God. You say, man, how do we do all this? I mean, we got struggles, we got trials, we got failures, we got desert places. I mean, come on, give me some good news. Well, here's your good news this morning. The mission of God goes on through the power of the Holy Spirit. How do we make it through? How does the mission go on? It goes on through the power of the Holy Spirit. Because when Christ died, He said, I'm going to send you a comforter. I'm going to send you someone. When I leave, I'm going to send you someone. And you're not, I'm, not only gonna, I, I'm no longer going to be walking beside you, but I'm going to be living within you. See, when I think about this, man, and I, and I look at the scriptures as a whole, and I think of, you know, Jesus walking on the earth. Here's the disciples, man. They're following after God. They're, man, they're seeing all these great miracles. They're seeing the lame, you know, the lame heal. They're seeing the blind see, and, and they're, they're, he, they're seeing the deaf come here to, to get hearing and the deaf to be, uh, the dead to be raised. They're seeing all those things. But what I see after Jesus what I see when Jesus leaves and the Holy Spirit comes on the scene, I see the disciples no longer seeing it, but the disciples doing it. 
We talked about Peter. Look at Peter's life whenever he was with Jesus. And then look at Peter's life after. Look at Peter's life when the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon him. When the power of the Holy Spirit falls upon him and he stands up boldly before and he preaches 3,000 people. And then here's Peter. He's raising the dead. Peter's healing the sick. Peter's doing all these things that Jesus did. Why? Because the power of the Holy Spirit now lived inside him. And how do we fulfill the mission of God? Is by allowing the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit to come in our life and rule and reign and for us to, to experience the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen, this is an Assembly of God church and we believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? But that's how we fulfill the mission of God. Without that power, we're powerless. John 16 said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, that it is, your, it is to your advantage that I go away, because if I don't go away, I, don't, I can't send the helper to come to you. But if I do go away, I will send him to you. Jesus sent us the Holy Spirit. He sent us the promise of the Holy Spirit. He goes on to say, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear to hear them right now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And you would de he will declare the things that are to come. The Holy Spirit wants to declare to the church the things that are to come. He wants to fill us with power. He wants to fill us with anointing so we can walk and we can do his mission and fulfill the mission of God, which is to know him and to make him known. Jesus told his disciples, he said, go and wait for the gift that I will pour out upon you. So here we come to the climax. Like I said, I've kind of been just reading through this whole period of time after Easter. So here we come to this climax of the story where, where Jesus is left. He's ascended to the Father. And he says, now you go wait, and I'm going to send the promise of the Holy Spirit. And when he comes down, he's going to fill you, and you're going to feel something different, and you're going to move in a different way. You're going to talk in a different way. You're going to live in a different way. And he's going to infuse the power of the Holy Spirit. It's going to infuse you to live for him. So I see this story, and then we come to the, to the Scripture, man, that, that our Pentecostal doctrine is stamped upon. And it says, when the day of Pentecost arrived, that they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And it divided as tongues of fire appeared upon them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This is the day of Pentecost. This is the day that Jesus poured out his power upon the church. Amen? Now, before you get too excited, I know you guys are ready to jump out of your seats. I can see it. I can see it. You guys are shaking. You're just ready to just explode with a shout of praise. Listen, the Holy Spirit, God did not give us the Holy Spirit so we could go around and have Holy Ghost parties. And you say, but whoa, Pastor Troy, hold on a second. Listen, I was raised in Pentecost. Okay, there was not a Sunday night at my church that we did not go and have a Jericho march. Come on, somebody. If you're laughing, you know what I'm talking about, all right? Listen, when my mom got wound up, listen, this is what I did right here. I just kind of shifted across the pew. That's when we had pews, not chairs. Because when my mom started screaming in the Holy Ghost and she started praying and her arms started waving, look out. So, listen, I am, I, I am all for it. I am all for it. As a matter of fact, Paul says in the Word, I speak in tongues more than all you. But that's not what it's about. It's not just about how good you can speak in tongues. It's not about how much you speak in tongues. Listen, I, we were at district council, like Pastor Tom said, and one of the pastors spoke on this. He said, listen, the, 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 the church today needs to put more emphasis on, the, on, on Acts 1-8 instead of Acts 2-4. You say, well, what's Acts 1-8? Well, in Acts 1-8, it says when, you re when, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, then you will receive power. What? Power to, to what? Power to be my witnesses. Power to fulfill the mission that I've called you to. Power to know me. Power to make me known. That is how we fulfill the mission of God. When we focus on the power of the Holy Spirit, 
And God gives us gifts. The Holy Spirit gives us gifts. And, man, we need to use those gifts, and we need to pray. If we have the gift of tongues, then pray in tongues and, and, and understand those gifts. But, listen, that is not the end all. If we have that, and this is in this church and in this body, and we don't take it out in the streets, and we don't uh, have be full of the power of God in our life, then we are not fulfilling the mission of God. We are stroking our egos. But you will receive power. What is this power? Well, it's power, it's strength, it's ability. One of the definitions of power is inherent power. Power residing, here it is again, in a thing, in us, by a virtue of its nature. Power to influence. Power to perform miraculous things. The Bible told, you know, Jesus told his disciples, he said, greater things are you going to do. Why? Because they're going to be infused with the power of the Holy Spirit. Because God is not alone walking beside them, but he's residing inside them. This morning, the mission goes on. The mission goes on. Christ finished his work on Calvary. Christ finished his job. But our job as a church, our job as individuals, is to continue the mission that God has created. That the mission goes on. It goes on through our struggles, through our trials, through our tests. The mission goes on. Through our failures, the mission goes on. Through our desert places, the mission goes on. And through the Holy Spirit, our mission goes on. You staying with me this morning? Can you stay in all over this room this morning? The mission of God is, in my opinion, is the whole reason we exist. Are we fulfilling the mission of God? Is Calvary Church fulfilling the mission of God? Are you personally fulfilling the mission of God? Because oftentimes we want to say, well, the church is not doing this. The church is not doing that. Well, I wish they would do this, and I wish they would do that. But what are you doing? Are we fulfilling God's mission on a personal level? Because if everyone in this room takes a personal responsibility to fulfill the mission of God, then that's a no-brainer, man, that this church, Calvary Church, is going to fulfill the mission of God. Are you struggling this morning to, 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 uh, to find your mission? We all have gifts and individual talents and different things that the Lord gives us. So I understand that. I understand the struggle to find yourself. And maybe you're, you're in college or maybe, you know, maybe you're a young adult. Maybe you're struggling. You're like, man, what is this plan? What does God have for me? I just keep going from one thing to another. And what is it? I understand that struggle. But whenever we, whenever we just look to God for that, whenever we, you know, put all our faith and our hope and our trust in God, we lean upon Him and not on understanding, then the, the rest takes care of itself. We do the mission of God. Everything else takes care of itself. Are we going, or are you going through a trial this morning? Are you going through a test this morning? You're just like, man, when's this ever going to be over? Understand that God's Holy Spirit wants to work through you and in you to help fulfill the mission of the church, to help fulfill that the, and let you understand that the mission goes on. Maybe you're struggling with a condemnation from the past. But this morning, understand that the mission goes on. The mission goes on. It's not God that's heaping condemnation on you. Recognize where that comes from. And accept the grace, accept the love, accept the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, and move on to the mission. Are you in a desert place this morning? God will meet you in that place. He will find you. Do not give up. Don't give hope. Don't give in. Continue to press for the mission. 